Well, today's big day. EOT's going in for open heart surgery. Oh, well, I already got the stack off so I can get it up in the shop. Get the forklift warming up here so that I can take the stand and the cherry picker up. And... Yeah. What do you think, pup? And then we'll get this thing warming up. Especially that because that's cold blooded as hell to tell LP. Um, so get these things meant to warm up. I'm gonna go get the trucks out of the shop so that we got room. And we'll catch you guys up there. Okay, so um, the bummer about this project is the engine shop that did the head on the, that he did the head on this, he did everything on our 1955 except grind the crank. Um, basically the guy that we normally have do all of our diesel stuff, um, he was getting to the point when I had him do the head two falls ago or two two summers ago. So it was right before the last right right before the ran tool before this last one, if that makes sense to you. So not twenty twenty one, it would have been twenty nine there in twenty nineteen I had the head done on this. Um he was having trouble finding help then. And he'd been doing engine, he'd been doing heavy duty diesel work since like I think he said the late 60s, early 70s, because he's down in Francisville and there's a lot of limestone quarries down there. So he did all of the loaders and rock trucks and excavate. He did all that. He had all the all the business down there from the limestone quarries plus the farmers and he built race engines and he he races funny cars and stuff like that, but um, when he did the head, he was having issues. He was having trouble finding help. And get this, the one kid that he said had the most promise, and basically, he was to the point where if this kid wanted it bad enough, he was just gonna hand the shop over to him. He was just, here, you wanna do it, it's yours. 
I'll stay on to help you, but it's your baby now. This kid was going to get an entire engine machine shop handed to him. He quit because his girlfriend didn't like him coming home dirty every day. I tell you what, if I ever had a girl who I was working my ass off to give a better life and help support and she told me one day when I came home that she needed me to quit my job because she didn't like me coming home dirty every day she'd be shit can faster than you blink an eye but anyway um so he uh was having issues with help want more of the story well I called him oh must have been about a month ago month three weeks ago something like that because i was trying to get stuff lined up to get this in and get get all the machine work done to it and he said uh, a few months ago his boring mill went down and it was going to take a lot of money to get it fixed and he said he didn't have any good help anymore and he basically just said he was getting to the point in his life where he said it was time to retire and he he said he'd occasionally do a little bit of head work so he still had the equipment to do that but he said as far as like heavy block or any major machining block work stuff like that he just said he he couldn't do it anymore because it was just that time and so that was out um i had another shop that i talked to up here in free fremont michigan i think is where it was um and i called him and he had he could do it but i decided that I, he wasn't getting anything of mine when i told him i told him i wanted the block decked i wanted the counter bores cut and i wanted the cam bearings pulled into it while he had it there and i wanted it boiled and i decided the minute he told or the minute he asked me as he said well what's wrong with the counter bores after i told him i wanted the block decked if you deck the block, you got to recut the counter bores because when you shave the block, the counter bores are going to be too shallow for the sleeve to fit in. If you know, if you're an engine machinist and you de this doesn't automatically click in your head, yeah, I ain't taking you nothing. So my next option was a place down here in South Bend, and the only reason I didn't call him second was because I know he's been busier than hell. Um, he did the head for my '66 last winter, and he said he. He said, basically, since COVID started, it has been nonstop balls to the walls, people bringing him stuff in, and he can't keep up. Um, and he's he's been having issues finding help, too. His, his crank grinder retired, and he hasn't been able to find another one, so he can't grind cranks right now. He said there's only one guy in michigan northern indiana and ohio there's one guy covering that entire territory that's grinding cranks right now um because there are no crank grinders left it's a dying skill um but he said he can get my he can get my crank done so if it needs ground it might just need polished he said he should be able to take care of polishing it but um i know for a fact that this engine is virgin because I looked in the uh, oil fill here at the rod at the uh, rod caps, and it still has six point rod bolts in it, which are the rod bolts that are supposed to be replaced. Were supposed to be replaced if a dealer ever pulled one of these down. Actually, I thought they were supposed to be a recall on them, but apparently this one never got it. So it just goes to show that all of the three ten nightmare stories that you hear aren't necessarily true about them because if this thing survived this long being as hot as it is with six point rod bolts in it it ain't necessarily a bad motor but i'm putting 12 point rod bolts in it which are the hardened rod bolts um so anyway back to the engine machining story um the guy i'm taking it to he's been busy as hell the last two years so he's got a backlog of work but he said He'll, he'll be able to get it done within a month. So, basically, I can't be tying up the shop with a tractor for that long. So, what we're going to do is get the engine and everything out of it. And then roll the chassis back down to the barn and put it back in the spot where it was before I dug it out next to Dad's grain truck. So, we will be able to get everything out, get the three-speed rebuilt, 
um, get that ready to go, get all my, get all the rest of my parts I need for the engine. Um, actually, all the rest of the parts I need is just the main and rod bearings and whatever odds and ends I come up with that I want to replace while I got it apart. Um, I need to call tomorrow when they open my the diesel shop I use and see where they're at on standardine parts because they were having issues getting parts for these pumps, not because of the fact that anything's going obsolete, but because of the fact that most of the standardine parts come out of Italy because we can't build anything in this country anymore. And when Italy was riddled with all the COVID bullshit, they weren't getting any shipments. So I want to get the pump done because it's already got all new injectors in it when I had the head done. Brand new injectors. They're not rebuilt. They're brand, brand new injectors. Um, I need to see possibly about getting a new number one injector line because this thing, the entire time we've had it, and I thought that it was a problem with like a cracked uh, ferrule on the old injector or something, but the entire time we've had it, it's always been wet up here on the nut, and I've tried polishing the ball on the on the uh, injector line end. The, the injector side is brand new, so that shouldn't be an issue. The nut is fine. I'm thinking that the injector line's got a crack up here inside the nut somewhere. So I'm going to, well, I'll have to, I'll have to get it apart and inspect it good this time. Um, but I might have to get a new number one injector line, which I should be able to get off of a parts tractor, no problem. It should be the same line as any other 310. Um, and yeah, other than that, just basically get it, get it stripped down to bare block, get the block in, get the crank in get the rods in because i'm having the rotating assembly balance because when you overhaul a 310 your money ahead to have the rotating assembly balanced it will greatly improve the longevity of the engine um now just a quick tidbit on 310s most or 310s mostly the turbocharged version the 1950t did not have the reputation for blowing motors like what they got like what they had when they got into the 1855 and 1955 the reason being and we have talked to guys that have worked with oliver about this the quality control and their quality standards in the late in in the mid to late 60s when the 50 series was being built were still the same same high quality standards that they had under the Oliver umbrella. When the 55 series came out, because White Motor, not White Farm Equipment, because White Farm Equipment was a separate division of White Motor, but White Motor controlled everything. White Motor, being the cheap asses that they were, and killing the corporate tractor project, we're looking to go cheap, cheap on everything. And when it come when it came to forgings and castings and stuff, the quality control under white during the 55 series completely tanked. There, there was no, there was hardly any quality control. That was all due to white motor. It had nothing to do with white farm equipment because white farm equipment was trying to fight it. White Farm Equipment was the one pushing the corporate program because that's the tractor they wanted to build, not the 55 Series that ended up being built. So that's why the 1855 didn't get an oil cooler was because they're trying to build it cheap. And that's why the 1855 and 1955 got the bad reputation for windowing blocks was because the rotating assemblies weren't balanced correctly. The block castings, they were letting flaws go through that should have never been let through. Um, like under the 19, when they were building the 1950, the oil cooler blocks were x-rayed. And if they found any crack, or if, if they found any flaws in them that were going to, um, be a detriment to the block under turbocharge use, that block got rejected for the 1950T. It got a block off plate on the oil cooler and that block went to a 1750 because there could have been, the block itself could have been okay, but there could have been some minute flaws in it that under the pressures of under the combustion pressures under turbocharging could have possibly led to a block failure but it would it, it was perfectly fine for a naturally aspirated engine so that's why you'll hear oil coolers what they call refer to as oil cooler block 1750s 
Um, the guy that I got the 8700 from had an original 1750 oil cooler block tractor that they bought brand new. So there's not that many of them out there, but they are out there. And that's the difference between the quality control and the 310s during the 50 series compared to the 55 series. And that's why you don't hear the horror stories of the 1950Ts windowing blocks like the 55 series did. So there's your there's your uh, 310 tidbit of information for the day. So anyhow, um, now that I've been talking for almost 13 minutes, um, I'm going to go get my drain pans and we're going to get the oil drained out of the crankcase, going to get the oil drained out of the three speed, get the coolant out of it. And while all that's draining, I'll start pulling sheet metal off, going to pull the grill, going to pull the radiator. Um, and get all the peripheral crap off and on the 1950 i don't know what dumbass in engineering came up with this this is the only tractor we found so far where this is even remotely close to an issue this gusset cast into the dash right right there that guy on every other 50 series or double up series for that matter because they all use pretty much the same dash that is up like up in here well, on this tractor, for some reason, it's all the way down at the base of the dash, and that does not give you enough room to wiggle the three-speed up out of the tractor without laying the dash back. What dumbass came up with that plan? I don't know if it's the same way on the Detroit 1950s or if that's just a 1950T thing. I don't know. So, you got to unbolt the dash and lay it back to get everything out. It's stupid. It's the only tractor we've run across like that. Every other one, it's not an issue. You pull your bolts, wham, bam, thank you, Sam, it's out. The dash isn't in the way anything. So, we got to do that too. But anyway, um, I'm going to go get my pans and we'll start draining and go from there. Okay, so I got everything out that's got the motor tied to the tractor. Everything's undone. 
um, wiring harnesses off, fuel lines, every, everything. So um, I've already had it flying once. And I think I'm going to try something real quick. I'm wondering, because the first time we pulled the motor out of this thing, we had the forklift. And when you got the forklift, you're limited to what you can do as far as like jockeying the engine around and tilting it and whatnot. Well, now that we got this thing, um, I'm almost wondering with a little bit of trickery if I can't get the engine out of here without screwing with the dash. Because if I could, it would be nice. So, I mean, even if I do, I, I have everything unhooked other than a couple hydraulic lines to lay the dash back. But I'm going to try this. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. It'd be neat. So, um, what we got to do is I got this thing picking up the front and we're going to have to get it up as high as we can get it because the problem you run into is in order to get the chain coupler past that gusset that's cast into the um, dash, you got to slide it forward while the bell housing hits the engine mounts. So I'm going to pick it up as high as I can and then push up on the bell housing from the bottom and get the chain coupler up as close as I can to that gusset and then hopefully that'll let me tilt the front of the motor up far enough to get the bell housing clear of the motor mounts and then the motor can go out that way in theory that's what I'm going to try if nothing else I have to unhook these two steering lines pull these two bolts for this uh, manifold block pull these bolts and then the dash should just slide it forward a little bit to get it past the uh floor pans and then it should lay back so here's hoping well that didn't work i ended up having to pull the dash but that right there will get me enough height that I, or get me the height i need to sneak this thing out so but i'm gonna do that with the forklift because i'm not so sure i trust that with the weight of the motor and the three speed hanging on there um Plus, if I have it hanging on there with the way the legs are on that, I won't be able to get the motor on the engine stand, which is kind of unhandy. So, yeah, I'm going to put it on the forklift. Now, we have a really nice, uh, it's like a two or a three ton gantry crane that goes in here. You know, got legs and four wheels on it and you roll it back and forth. And it's got a trolley on it and manual chain fall. I'm pretty pretty sure it's either two or three ton and i was going to get that to do this project because that's a whole lot easier than a forklift but dad lent it out to some friends of ours and told us don't worry about bringing it back anytime soon we're not going to need it so now it's buried in their shop behind a dead planter and a dead sprayer that can't come out so i'm stuck doing it this way not happy about it but it is what it is but you mean damn sure I'm going to try to have the thing back to put it back together because it's just so much easier being able to do that. You can stand right next to the motor and run the chain fall and look at what's going on and not have to try to yell over the in or yell over the fork truck running and all that yada yada yada. So, but anyway, to get the fork truck up here, I got to get all that crap out of here to get me some room to work. So, I'm going to bring a pallet up here, get all my parts that we don't need out of here and. We'll uh, catch you guys when we're ready to fly that motor out of there.
should clear if you cut it hard. Well, that part's done. Like I said, this is, I'd be curious to look at a 1950 with a Detroit to see if the dash is the same way. And I'd be curious to look at an 1850 because I know the 1750 uses the same dash as an 1800 and an 1800 ain't got a problem because we've had Motor out of 1600, motor out of the 1800, motor out of 1955, none of them. Not a single one do you even have anything remotely close to a clearance issue with the dash. This is the only model that I've ever seen or heard of where you even got to do anything related to anything on the dash to get it out of the way to get the motor out. I don't know what the hell they were thinking when they did this. So, I don't know. Normally, any other tractor, it does not take that long. Come on. Yeah, let's go with that later. The other thing I'm going to do is get that input shaft seal and do that while we got the motor out because I've learned if you got the motor out on one of these, whether that seal's leaking or not, replace the son of a bitch because sure as shit it's going to start leaking if you want you put the motor back in because that's what the 1600 did. So... While the motor's out, I'm going to do that input shaft seal. Um, the chain coupler on this thing has been replaced. The chain coupler and the chain both. Um, actually, the whole three-speed's been rebuilt, but I know who I know the dealer that rebuilt the three-speed, so I'm going to rebuild it again. Um, they actually... When I first got this thing, it you really only noticed it in sixth gear, but in sixth gear over going down the road, it would get this really bad, like, rattle you right out of the seat shutter to it. And the only way to get it to stop would be to shift all the way down and idle all the way down, damn near come to a crawl, and it would quit, and then you could idle back, or rev back up and take off again. Wouldn't really do it in any other gear, but, um, when... When I did the head on it, we left the motor in it. I'm trying to remember what the reason was we pulled the motor the last time. Maybe it was specifically to check that out because we thought it was like it. Maybe we thought it was a clutch. But anyway, um, we had the motor out of this thing and split it or got the motor out, divorced the three speed from the engine. Looked all over the clutch, couldn't find nothing. And then we went and took a look at the, or got the clutch and everything. I was forgetting to see the pilot bearing. And the pilot bearing had this like piece of shim stock wadded up inside of it. And we're looking like, what the hell? We pull that out. We measure the ID of the bearing and the OD of the three-speed input shaft because this is this is the landing where the or where the pilot bearing rides and this was i can't even remember how much smaller than the uh pilot bearing could not for the life of us because you can't put the only way to get a smaller pilot would be to put an input shaft out of like a 1655 in it. But you put a sh input shaft out of 1655 in it, these splines are going to be smaller because the 1655 runs a smaller clutch disc. So these splines are, or this whole OD of the shaft is smaller. So it's not like they put the shaft out of a different three speed in it, but somehow. And it wasn't like it wore this way. It was like it, it was a, it was a very nice, true. The whole thing was wore. It was the whole thing was worn true. So it had to have been machined. But 
this whole shaft was undersized. So what we ended up having to do, because I haven't taken the three speed apart yet, the whole time we've had it is, um, we polished up with some sandpaper or with some emery cloth, the, uh, OD that was there turned up a bushing to shrink over it. We turned it. I, when I turned it, I turned it, turned the ID slightly, slightly undersized so we could heat it up, put it on there. It shrunk. And then, um, because normally when you do something like that, you put it on there with the OD rough, roughed in. And then once you got it on there, you would take it, chuck the whole shaft back up in the lathe and turn your uh, OD down to nominal size. Well, because we didn't tear three speed apart and we needed to fix this so that it would actually fit the pilot bearing and get rid of that vibration. Um, we, dad took it with a TIG and TIG, once we got it on there and got it shrunk to fit, he tigged it on there so it's actually welded it's part of the shaft it's part of the shaft now and then when i turned it i turned it obviously turned it undersized so that it would so that it would shrink fit and then the same amount that i made it undersized i made it oversized on the od and then basically i spent probably better part of two hours with emery cloth and just started working on it until i could slip fit the uh pilot bearing on there so that shaft is fixed unless there's something screwy inside there's really no reason to replace it but the the stupid part of it is when the guy that we bought this from who owned it for the vast majority of its life i think he, he was the second owner but he bought it when it wasn't that old um when he had the dealer go through it they rebuilt the three speed gave it back to him he found out that it had that vibration and mostly in road gear eventually sometimes you'd notice it in fifth but um, for the vast majority of when it did, it was in road gear and he asked the dealer and they said that it's, there were some parts that were war. That's the best that we could do. It's always going to be like that. It's no big deal. So that's the kind of shoddy work they do. So, but that's why they had the shim stock wadded up inside that bearing was to try to get the idea of the bearing down to match the worn or turned or whatever the hell they did to the end of the shaft od on on the pilot so but that's why i'm tearing this three speed apart and rebuilding it again is because i know the dealer that rebuilt it and they were shit mechanics they might have been better back when they actually were an oliver dealer because by that time they were they were an agco dealer but they have they were a massey dealer and i know a lot of people that had Massey's worked on down there and almost every one of them got fucked up in one way shape or form they screwed this thing up they're just i'm rebuilding it making it right it might be fine in there but at least if i put all new parts in it and i look at it i know it's right so anyway um as far as what we got going on uh first order of business tomorrow is going to be to get this thing back or get the chassis back down in the barn so that it's out of dad's way uh, next order of business tomorrow is going to be to call the injection pump shop and see what see where they're at as far as parts and um, time frame of getting the pump rebuilt and then we'll get the engine tore down tomorrow which shouldn't take that long especially since i don't got to disassemble the head i'm just taking the head off um and we'll hope hopefully have enough time tomorrow to get it all the way tore down Actually, I know I'll have enough time tomorrow. The only reason I'm quitting early today is because tonight's Yellowstone night, so I got to go get ready for Yellowstone. But um, tomorrow night, get the engine tore all the way down, get the crank out of it, get the block pa uh, strapped down in a pallet, get the crank mic, figure out what we got going on there. Um, should be able to get everything packaged up and ready to go to the machine shop. And then once that's all taken care of, we will start focusing on the three speed, get the three speed apart, figure out what I got for clutch plates in there so I can count the splines, get clutch plates coming for that. Once I get the clutch plates coming, I have all the other parts I need. We can get the three speed rebuilt, put back together, setting on a pallet, ready to go back in once we get the motor done. So 
And then once all this is done, and if we get, hopefully he can give me like a week advance when the motor's gonna be done and we can get the tractor back up in here because while the motor's out of it, I want to redo these two power steering lines because the rubber on them is getting kind of sketchy. So I want to get these lines done. All these, the other two power steering lines have been done already. So we just, um, one of them's a return line and one of them is the one that feeds the oil cooler. Um, so I'm going to get those done and I'm going to uh, start making the uh, monitor brackets for the planter, which I'm probably going to make something that bolts on this frame pad and comes up and holds them right about here is kind of where I want to have them. Um, and when I wired up the flashers and everything on this, I put them on their own switch and I put the switch where the 12 volt reset used to be which isn't that big of a deal because if i would have had even if i'd had the 12 volt reset there that would have meant you'd had to have the power cable strung up over the hood and you'd have this whole you'd have a, a wire hanging loose up here and being in the way of the steering and all that so what i want to do is find a spot down tucked in here somewhere out of the way where you can't really see it unless you know it's there and mount a 12 volt reset here that way the uh, cords will run down and you'll be able to just plug it in there and it'll be nice and neat and out of the way and out of the dust and safe and whatnot so and then the rest of them will probably It'd be nice. Probably make some sort of holder that uses this grip hole and this grip hole and runs the other cords right down along the floorboard and sticks them out back there next to the hydraulic outlet. That way everything looks nice and clean and neat. So, but that's kind of the plan is if I can get this thing up here and get all that done before we put the motor back in. That way, once the motor's back, we can slap the motor back in and get it out of here and we'll be good. Now, the other thing that I noticed when I pulled the live shaft out of it is the hydro or the rear end oil is all the way up to the live shaft through hole in the power takeoff, which is not right. It's supposed to be all the way down here. So it's up to here. So you got about two inches, maybe three inches. And when I got it out of the barn, the hydraulic oil was low, but it wasn't empty. And there's only two ways for the hydraulic oil to get from the reservoir into the rear end. And that's a crack in the pan, which if there's a crack in the pan, there wouldn't be any oil in it at all or leak through the seals in the hydraulic pump. So that's got me wondering if the seals in the hydraulic pump got kind of dry while it was sitting and it leaked out through the pump into the rear end. But I've had this thing out for better part of a month now. And I filled up the hydraulic oil all the way to the full line on the dipstick. And after I noticed that, I checked it and it's still all the way up to the full line on the dipstick. So I don't know if when I started running it again, if those seals got lubricated and they sealed back up. Um, until this thing started throwing a shit fit with the engine, last, last fall when I blew the head gasket, kind of changed plans because my original intention for this thing was last winter was to bring it up here tear the rear end apart and go through the hydraulics on it and get those back up to snuff. Well, then it blew the head gasket and the engine took priority over the hydraulics. So as long as it quits transferring oil between the hydraulics and the rear end for one more season, that's going to be the plan for next fall or, or next winter is to pull the 
hydro or pull the hydraulic unit off and go through the rear end and go through the hyd hydraulics so but like i say it's been a month it's been sitting down there in a the barn and running on and off and coming in and out and the hydraulic oil is still clear full to the top so i don't know but it sat for probably close to 12 months on the dot down in the barn before i moved it so i don't know i know like i gotta say i know it's not a cracked pan because if the pan was cracked all the oil out of the hydraulic reservoir would be in the rear end and it's not like you got oil meeting oil because that the hydraulic oil's down here and the bottom of the pan is probably right about here so there's still an air gap so it's not like you filled the rear end all the way up and it can't get any more hydraulic oil in there so we'll just have to keep an eye on it and see So anyway, that's enough of me talking. Um, I got to get out of here. So I think we're going to call this one the end of part one. And part two will pick up tearing the motor down. So I guess we will catch you guys tomorrow in part two. Oh, and I probably... That's it for this one. We'll catch you guys on the next one. I got to end the video that way because that's what I always do.